Well, hello everybody. Today is Wednesday, May 8th, 2019, and this is a class on your relationship with money. So our whole purpose today is to give you some insights on your beliefs about money, things that you might not have really thought about before, and help you tie that in to your overall behavior and some of your automatic behavior that you might not be aware of. And one of the big ahas that some people get out of a class like this is an insight that helps them see why they're holding themselves back from maybe re receiving as much money as they want, <coughs> excuse me, or some other such thing. A lot of people in our morning class had all sorts of interesting insights, and it turned out that many of them were not holding them back related to money. It was other things, and we'll get into that too. So what we're all going to do today is start with an exercise that will help you bring to the surface some of the underlying subconscious beliefs that you might have about money. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to have you create a four-column table. And think about the fa fact that most of the beliefs that you created about the world and how the world works happened when you were about three to five. Now, your money beliefs probably will have evolved over that time because as you grow older, you become eight, nine, ten. You start wanting things and you start hearing things that your parents tell you about whether you can or can't have certain things and how they talk about money and how we need money to buy things. So your money beliefs could be influenced by the significant people in your core family or whoever you grew up with from all the way up to maybe your high school or your college years. So what I want you to do is in the first column of your table, think about the people who would have made an impression on you in terms of representing how the world works. So for most of us, if we were raised by our parents, our mom and our dad will be the most significant people who represented how the world works because of just the way they talked about the world and everything they said about the world. I mean, we didn't know who else to believe. We would have only believed what our parents told us about the world and how it works. Now, for some of us, we lived in extended families, and so there may have been uncles and aunts, grandparents that represented that to us, who we listened to, who we respected, and who told us things about the world. For some of us, we may have had caregivers, teachers that were with us for a long time that made a big impression. But the people that I want you to think about are the people that that would have made an impression on you when you were quite young. So think about ages, let's say 5 to 10 or something like that. All right. So for me, it turns out that for the most part, it was just my mom and dad who formed that impressionable idea of, you know, what money is and what it means and whether it's easy or hard to get and that kind of thing. So in the next three columns, what you're going to do is jot down for yourself some information on what you would have picked up from these people. And it's important to understand that your job is not to psychoanalyze your mom and your dad and anybody else who was in your life at that time because what they really believed about money is actually less significant than what you thought they believed about money. So how would you have formed your beliefs based on watching them, listening to them. Well, you will have noticed and remembered certain things that they said repeatedly about money, and that's what I want you to put in column two. The kinds of phrases and words and things that your parents or whoever else was significant to you, what did they say about money when you were young? And then in the third column, what kinds of things did they do that seem to you to be related to money. So for example, my mom and many of the people in our class happened to go to stores that were more discount stores like Kmart at the time. And I would notice that some of my friends would maybe go to the mall to buy clothes. And so that was something that was very impressionable to me. I would compare, well, how come my mom goes to Kmart to buy clothes and my friend's mom's goes go to Saks Fifth Avenue. 
And that wasn't always the case, and that might not have, not have even been the reality of what happened. Maybe my mom went to the mall for clothes when she wanted to buy clothes. Maybe the reason she went to Kmart is because she was buying us clothes that we would grow out of, and she didn't think it was worth spending a lot of money on it. But that doesn't matter. What matters is what I thought her behavior meant. So what kinds of things did they do related to money that you were aware of and made an impression on you when you were young? And then in the last column, what you're going to write is what you think maybe they believed about money. And it's almost better if instead of thinking now, looking back, what you thought they believed about money, it's if you think, when I was a kid, what did I think they believed about money? So, for example, when I was a kid, my dad used to talk about people that made a lot of money with a lot of disdain. Right, so they were bad people. Um, he probably had a lot of memories related to people who were wealthy and dishonest in his past, and he would talk about that. He kind of, in my in my mind, he had a belief that people who were wealthy were dishonest and not to be trusted. So that's sort of what I picked up from him. Now, whether that's his true belief or not, I have no idea. That's not what matters. What matters is what I thought. So some of you are going to fill out this table a little bit quicker than others. For those of you that are maybe all finished with the table already, there are three reflection questions at the bottom that I'd like you to jot down some thoughts. One is, what did you soak in? Two is, what was your unique spin on it? And three is, how does it tie into your core belief pattern? Now, some of you might not have done any thinking about what your core belief pattern is yet, and that is fine. Let me just give you an idea of what I'm talking about. So we all have a core belief pattern. And what I mean by your core belief pattern is the key beliefs that you formed when you were young that told you how to survive in the world that told you what you needed to do to survive and get your needs met in the world. That's your core belief pattern. And a lot of the work that we do here at Aspire is about discovering that for yourself because some of those beliefs serve you, but some of them don't serve you. And the core beliefs that don't serve you are the ones that are to blame for all the ways that you may get in your own way in life or you may sabotage yourself in life. So it's important for us to discover those so that we can turn them around when they're not serving us. Most of our beliefs serve us just fine. But identifying the core beliefs that don't serve us is really important and can be very useful in terms of changing our life around. So when I work with people, a lot of the work I do with people is helping them discover this, especially if they have some internal battle that they're fighting where they feel like they're getting in their own way. So we don't always do this work, but we do do this work when people feel like they're sort of getting bumping up against themselves and they feel kind of a push-pull and so they may be going for a goal but then they feel like they get almost to the finish line and then they hold themselves back and if they feel like they're holding themselves back usually there's a core belief at play so your core beliefs are going to affect every aspect of your life in some way it's going to affect your relationship with time. It's going to affect your career. It's going to affect how you serve other people. It's going to affect your health, your family relationships, how you love, and it is going to reflect your relationship with money. So when we go back and look at the table, when I ask this question, how does it tie into your core belief pattern? If you happen to know or have done some work on your core belief pattern, what you might want to think about is how does my relationship with money tie into my core belief. And I'll give you an example from my own life because I've done a lot of this work. So my core belief pattern is about separation anxiety. And so there's another model I'm going to show you. Whoops, we're going the wrong way here. And this other model I'm going to show you is our layered belief model. So we talk about how we have certain unmet needs. We believe that something is scarce in the world, and usually it's a form of love. Okay? So my form of love was that people would leave me, separation anxiety. So I was very afraid that people would not stay with me, that I couldn't depend on them to stay with me. So after discovering that, then I was able to discover, as part of my core belief system, what is it that I thought would help keep people close to me? Well, in my case, it was managing my relationships. So I learned or decided when I was young that if I 
made myself useful to people and they needed me in some way, then they would stay close to me. But if I was useless to them, then they would leave me. So I developed a survival belief that told me how I could make myself useful to people or what would make people like me. And one of the things that I decided, and this is just based on my family dynamics, is that if I got too much positive intention from people in authority, like from my parents, then my siblings would be very, very resentful, or at least some of them that mattered to me would be very resentful, and then they wouldn't be my friend anymore because they would be mad at me for you know, for showing them up. And if I was at school and I was the star student and the teachers were adoring me, uh, and the other kids that I wanted to be friends with, sometimes they would call me a teacher's pet or say mean things to me, and then I would have a hard time making friends. Well, friends mattered way more to me with my belief system than, you know, than performing. So what I ended up doing is developing a survival strategy that would hold myself down and not make myself too visible to other people. And especially if I had big accomplishments, I would kind of hide those. And so making a lot of money would be a really big accomplishment. So I have never been very um, showy about any money that I've made because that would be something that in my mind, completely made up in my mind, would possibly make somebody not like me. So that is how my money beliefs might tie into my core belief system. And that's what we're going to maybe look at for you today. Now, we might not get to all of you, but my goal today is to get to some of you, get you all at least something to think about, something to work on, something to discover as you're moving forward. So some initial insights here about what your money beliefs might be and then some ideas about how that might tie into your core beliefs. And then how can you practically use this information to move yourself forward towards whatever you're going for? So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to turn off the recording. So those of you who are listening to the recording, we're going to stop for a while, and then I will come back on to give you a summary. But for the rest of you, now we're going to take a look at what your results from the exercise is. Okay, well, I'm back, and we just spent a half hour in a very in-depth discussion with everyone on the call. But during that time, I left the recording off so that people could be very open with the insights that they had. What I'm going to do is share with you some of the patterns and the things that we talked about. So most people got some interesting insights about their past and how their beliefs now tie to their beliefs in their past. And for some people, they actually found some things that they really cherished. So for example, I actually like how I have developed the habit of frugality from my past, and that serves me just fine. But maybe what doesn't serve me just fine is a belief that my parent, well, one of my parents had about how they couldn't trust people who were wealthy. And wealthy people being untrustworthy made me be really become very reluctant to become a wealthy person myself. So in that way, I began to hold me back. So that does not serve me. So people started thinking about, well, what serves me and what doesn't serve me and what do I want to change? And I don't remember if I did this before I got into the group discussion or not, but I think I did show you this model where your core beliefs are going to stretch in and touch on all of your other beliefs. So for some people, they started realizing that they had money beliefs that were tied to their sense of worthiness. For So we had somebody on the call um, who had a parent who had been very wealthy and then lost money and so then was struggling but at the same time made sure that she staged her home so that she would always look and appear wealthy. And the lesson was that if you appeared wealthy, then you would be worthy, um, but that you had to be wealthy to be worthy. And so that was an interesting insight. And then there was somebody else that talked about how they were way too frugal and way too anxious about losing money, and it was causing a lot of friction in their relationship because there's a, they were in a very well-to-do family, and everyone else spent freely, but this person didn't want to 
spend freely. So there's a lot of stress and conflict in the relationship. And so this person is going to think more deeply about what the fear is. So the other model that we showed a lot is the multi-level belief model. Because your money beliefs are going to tie into this in some way. Um, they're going to tie into this more if you've got issues with money. If you don't have any issues with money, then your money beliefs probably aren't going to tie into your core beliefs. But your core beliefs usually have something to do with love. So when people talk about worthiness, I'm going to say that has something to do with love. Because when I say I'm not worthy, what, what am I worthy of or or not worthy of, and typically it's I'm not worthy of being loved. I'm not worthy of being respected. I'm not worry, worthy of being in the tribe. So as humans, in order to survive, we need other people to love us. We need to be in the community, in the tribe, and we have to have status in that tribe. And so these are unconditional needs that we have, yet when we grow up, we have fear. And in our primary families, there are always some of these things that we feel that we're not getting. And at some point, we don't feel like we can count on these things. So we, we don't feel like, some people feel like they got unconditional love. Many people felt like they did not get unconditional love. And so they developed a scarcity belief, which was, I can only get love, a survival belief that put a condition on love. I only get to be loved if. So love is not abundant for me. Being worthy is not abundant for me. All these things are not abundant for me. I can't get enough love because I have to do X or I have to be X, right? So um, for many people, I can't get enough love unless I am wealthy, unless I achieve by making a lot of money. On the other hand, a lot of people might have, I can't get enough love unless I'm super frugal, unless I'm being seen as being responsible for money, unless I'm not frivolous. So there's beliefs that sound something like that. For other people, it might be um, nothing at all related to money. It might be, I can't... Um, I don't get enough love unless um, I please other people. But because sometimes having too much money might make somebody else jealous, then they make sure that they don't show off that they have too much money because it would make something jealous. So that's a case where a money pattern doesn't have anything to do with money. It has to do with the core belief that drives you to do people-pleasing behaviors. So there's a little bit of analysis involved in this, not as much, but the main thing that we talked about also is how do you change these things? And a lot of people are told to do affirmations to change things, and I'm going to say this on the recording because I said it way a lot. I said it a lot in both sessions, and I said saying affirmations is like frosting on poop. So you can tell yourself, I'm good enough, or there's an abundance of money out there. But if you don't really believe it, you can still say it 100 times a day. And, you know, it's still, there's still an inner conflict. There's still a, a deeper part of you that says, yeah, that's not true because that's not the evidence that I witnessed. What you really have to do if you want to change a belief is you have to reopen the case. You have to basically say, okay, I did have evidence when I was young that said money was scarce. So if I had evidence when I was young that said money was scarce, what I want to do now is rethink the problem. So I had one person that said, well, I was told, given two messages when I was a child. One message was, it's really hard to get money. The other thing I learned when I was a child is when I needed money, I could go to my dad and get money. So money's scarce, but when I need it, I can go to my dad. So what I ended up doing is attaching myself to men who had money, and that was my survival strategy. But now I don't want to attach myself to men that have money because these men, many of them are jerks and I don't really love them and they don't really love me. And I want to be in relationships for love, not because there's a man that has money. So how can I change that belief so I can feel abundant about being able to make money in other ways? Well, the way to do that would be to not to say, not to have an affirmation necessarily. Well, you could. It would help a little bit maybe that says, 
uh, money's abundant. I can make money in different ways, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But what you might want to do is actually reconsider the belief. Okay, when I was young, the only way that I knew to get money was from my father. I was super resourceful. And as I grew up, I replicated that. And I found men that had a lot of money. And that was a very easy way for me to get money because I was charming and I was sweet and I was cute. And so I could attract any man I wanted. So that was a very easy way for me to get, get money. But now I want to get money and I may not want to use that way. So I want to reconsider the possibility that there are other ways for me to have an abundance of money. Let me see if I can do some research. Let me see if I can go out and look in the world. So changing a belief is actually a little bit like a research project. So what we did on the call, um, and these are the kinds of things you can only really do if you come to the sessions live or you do the live calls, is we went person by person. We talked about what they discovered from their exercise. We walked them through this process a little bit, and we left them with one thing to think about or ponder, some beliefs to think about, some questions to ask themselves, some evidence to gather to take with them. So with you, I hope you've gathered some information from doing this original exercise and that you've managed to get some good insights from hearing some of the things that I've talked about on the call today. And if you have any questions at all, please feel free to reach out. I would be happy to answer any of your questions. You can email me by going to the website, or you can call or text me. I see the number is not on the screen, but you can call or text at 714-931-2133. So good luck with this, and what I wish for all of you is an abundance of money.